So thank you all for coming. And those of you in the back, I can assure you it's much warmer down front. So feel free to move closer. Anyway, thank you for coming. And um, um, we've got only an hour to talk about something we could probably talk about for the next 10 hours or so. So let me be get right to the point. Um, let me introduce our speakers first. Uh, Mayor James Numalo of Durban, South Africa, who is the political international lead for the Durban Charter and has been committed since day one many years ago. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Sean O'Donoghue, Dr. Sean O'Donoghue, um, Environment Planning and Climate Protection Department. Sean is with, he's part of the leadership of the Durban Adaptation Charter Secretariat located in the city of Durban out of the municipal government. So he's the heart and soul of this out of Durban. And our final, not our final speaker, our next speaker, Susan Torriente, will be speaking by Skype. She is the assistant city manager for the city of Miami Beach. Her city, her prior city, Fort Lauderdale, are members of the Durban Adaptation Charter family. And she will be speaking to us in a little bit as well. Um, our last speaker on the panel is Valanavo Kavagali who is the, um, from the Department of Environmental Affairs and the government of South Africa. In other words, we have the urban government and the national government represented here. We've got the complete spectrum of South African government here. So with that said, let me now dive into the substance of why we're here today. Let's talk about the Durban Adaptation Charter. Um, what is it? <laughs> this is it. That's the Durban Adaptation Charter. It's a piece of paper. Um, it's a piece of paper that's been signed by over a thousand elected officials from various cities throughout the world, mostly Africa and Asia, but more and more coming to sign the charter from other parts of the world. Um, the charter was born on the margins of COP17. Uh, where the city of Durban hosted a workshop for three days. And at the end of those three days, over 800 officials from various parts of the world internationally vetted the text of the Durban Adaptation Charter. At the end of those three days, they approved the Durban Adaptation Charter, and that document was born. The document's a commitment that elected officials sign a commitment to take adaptation actions, a variety of actions that are laid out in the charter itself. However, shortly after that happened, a number of people, a small number of people, international experts on adaptation, elected officials within the Durban Adaptation Charter family as well, we decided that we didn't need one more piece of paper collecting dust in the world. And we decided instead to see if we could take this piece of paper and transform it from a piece of paper to a platform for action. So in March of 2013, we convened in Durban, the city of Durban, and we basically fleshed out during that time what would become um, the plan of action, a plan of action and a strategy for implementing action. Now, all of the actions that you're going to hear about today are part of that plan. We're still implementing the game plan, but the game plan, the roadmap, has remained the same. We created that in March of 2013. So two and a half years later, here we are with a bunch of things to sort of present to you and uh, discuss um, at the Q&A. So, Beyond the things I've already told you about, what makes the Durban Adaptation Charter unique? For me, here are the things that make it unique. It's not about negotiations, it's about action. It's a network that's focused on taking action. It's not about talking. 
It's not into negotiations. It's the second largest urban network in the world to date, second to ICLE. Um, it's the only network I'm aware of that is primarily aimed at climate change adaptation. It doesn't sort of obviate the need to do mitigation, but it recognizes the need to integrate. But adaptation is first and foremost for the Durban Adaptation Charter City. Cities. It's a coalition of the willing. Nobody was dragged into this. Everybody got into it because they wanted to be there. Um, it's presently composed, as I said earlier, of elected officials from over a thousand cities now, mostly Africa and Asia. And um, these are the low income cities for the most part, low to mo moderate income cities. These are the most vulnerable cities that the IPCC and other reports have talked about. Largely, the membership are those cities to date. And lastly, and not lastly, but it's Africa-led out of Durban. This whole enterprise is led out of Durban, South Africa. And I've been with this since the beginning, and I can tell you that this leadership is world-class. It's the finest kind there is. Um, so how did the DAC accomplish, the Durban Adaptation Charter accomplish what it has in the short period of time? We've only been in existence since March of 2013, yet we have a number of accomplishments that you'll hear about. How then were we able to do it? Well, first of all, we decided not to sit around and wait for money to show up. We decided to start acting and doing things. The money would come later. We decided we needed to do things to show that we really, really meant what we said. And in fact, the city of Durban has invested tremendously into this from its own municipal coffers. It's driven by a vision and an implementation plan. We have a roadmap. We have a vision and a roadmap, and we stick to it. It's what's being implemented as we speak. Um, We've remained, we've acquired a number of partners over the years now too, but all of us from the very beginning, one of the earmarks of the Durban Charter is we've remained doggedly committed. I mean tenaciously committed to this. We didn't waffle, there were no fence sitters. We're really committed to making this happen. Uh, we were unafraid to take risks. We knew that there's going to be times things didn't turn out but we weren't afraid to take those risks and learn from them. So that was another feature of the Durban Adaptation Charter. And again, I want to just say that the membership has been, you know, something to really, that's another story in itself, the leadership of this. And in the end, or as I want to bring this to a close, I found the partnership this international partnership of which my agency, EPA, the Office of International Affairs, and me personally, it's been one of the best partnerships, the most effective partnerships that I've ever been involved in. And so this, again, is something that's a really world-class partnership. Um, I think I'll leave my introductory comments at that at that and introduce Mayor Numalo, who has been the mainstay, the political leader internationally for the Durban Adaptation Charter, and who has supported the charter endlessly since its beginning, never once wavering. So, Mayor, would you say a few words? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And thank you for your kind words and for inviting our delegation from the city of Durban, Eti Unman's Palette in South Africa, to be part of this uh, event. I'd also like to thank the U.S. State Department for their interest in the Deben Adaptation Charter 
and efforts to advance climate change adaptation at a local level. Since 2011, COP17 Climate Change Conference, the Durban-based Secretariat has made good, good progress in implementing the Charter, and the Charter now has 341 signatories from mayors and leaders of local government associations, representing 1,069 signatories from 46 countries. And most of these cities are from the Global South, where climate change adaptation is very important to reduce vulnerability in communities and improve livelihoods. And over the past two years, Durban has engaged in a number of city-to-city -city learning exchange visits. And in these sessions, you'll hear how these visits have led to the development of the hub and compact approach for implementing the Durban Adaptation Charter. As a result of these exchange visits, a number of successes have been achieved. Most importantly, these visits have focused on capacity building. And through partnerships and the sharing of knowledge, city officials are empowered to tackle climate change challenges. In smaller municipalities in South Africa, there is frequently just one official responsible for a wide range of environmental work streams. This can be overwhelming, but through partnerships, these officials are empowered to work effectively and efficiently. The exchange, visit were, uh, the exchange visits were funded by the United States Agency for International Development through the CityLinks program. And I would like to thank these two organizations for such a productive and successful working partnership. The number of city officials in Africa that are working effectively to combat climate change has grown substantially over the past two years. And the exchange visit series can take some credit for this capacity development. And I would like also to extend my special thanks to Dr. Anthony Sochi and the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of the International and Tribal Affairs from the United States of America for its work in helping to implement the DAC or the Deben Adaptation Charter and helping to forge strategic partnerships. I would like also to request this office uh, to continue uh, involving with the Charter's uh, implementation and as part of the DAC Steering Committee. Lastly, Program Director, I look forward to overseeing the implementation of further partnership development and capacity building in signatory cities. And I hope that you will be inspired by the story that will be unfolded in this session and that you'll become part of Durban Adaptation Charter's history. I thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Merci. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Um, Susie, can I take a minute to introduce you? Susan I just wanted Turiantra. to make sure I was connected. The, yeah, it's working, great, good to see you. I could use some of that sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Susan Torriente, the Assistant City Manager from Miami Beach, Florida, who is an integral part of the Durban Adaptation Charter family, is gonna talk about how they linked up with Durban in the beginning of this these compacts that came about as a result of this getting together of Fort Lauderdale and uh, Durban. 
Go ahead, Susie. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you, um, at least virtually, and, and share part of our story. Um, I bring you greetings from the front lines of climate action from the city of Key West, Florida, where just this week, uh, 450 or so local elected officials and appointed officials gathered at the um, seventh annual uh, regional summit for the Southeast Florida Climate Compact. And it's really just uh, amazing that we've been doing this now for seven years and we have been able to uh, create um, these linkages like we have with, with Durban. Um, I wanna just spend a few minutes and tell you the story of how South Africa and South Florida got together. And it's, um, I think it's a really uh, interesting story. And uh, I must say that it is probably um, the most significant thing I, that has occurred to me in my 25 years of local government um, um, professional experience. Um, it was just a, early in 2013, a regular day in the office, and I received an email from ICMA, the City Links Program, and they were interested in finding an American city that could partner with Durban to um, discuss these issues of, of climate change. And um, I was intrigued by the Durban Adaptation Charter. And when I read a little bit more about it, I realized that there were so many things that we had in common, uh, local governments you know, across the globe, but there were issues that brought us together. So I responded and I not only spoke about my experience in local government, uh, both in Miami-Dade County and the city of Fort Lauderdale, but I actually talked about the, um, the Southeast Florida Climate Compact. And the compact is a very uh, unique document uh, that was uh, created back in tw uh, 2009, the beginning of uh, 2010. And it was a, a document very simple, like the, the, the DAC document itself also, where four counties and uh, that represented an area of 5.8 million people and more than 100 cities these four counties came together and they agreed to work on climate adaptation and climate mitigation. And it was a voluntary collaborative of these four governments. And really it's, um, it's very interesting because it is a, a, a bipartisan effort, and maybe actually a nonpartisan effort um, to bring together uh, these local governments. So the story goes something like this, and, and I think Sean can elaborate. Um, uh, Deborah Roberts was looking at all the different cities and looking at all the different things that were happening in the states, but she was intrigued with this notion of regional collaboration and governance. And therefore, um, Fort Lauderdale and Broward County, representing South Florida, were chosen to be uh, in this exchange program. And I'm grateful to City Links, to ICMA, and of course to the 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 the, the U.S. Um, State Department for funding this program. Six months later, um, two of us from South Florida had the opportunity to visit our friends um, and now our colleagues in in Durban, and we had an exchange. We talked about what we were doing, and again, um, I think the the staff at Durban was intrigued about this notion of how do you work with other cities. How do you start to work with the people who are your next door neighbors? And so the, we, we continue to have these exchanges. We, uh, we were able to meet again where, where Deborah came to our fifth annual summit and gave the keynote address. Um, a few months later, the South African delegation visited South Florida and we hosted them in the city of Fort Lauderdale. Um, we had tours, we had conversations, we had field trips. We had basically just a, a continuing this dialogue, talking about on the ground, front lines, what we were doing. And um, the, the this story doesn't end there. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on a panel with Sean um, earlier this year in, um, in, uh, in, in Bonn. And then I got to see Deborah earlier this year also um, in, in the, uh, we were actually in, Tony hosted us in, um, in Washington, D.C. And it was so incredibly rewarding when I found out that um, the municipalities uh, surrounding Durban and Durban itself created a climate compact replic replicating what we started here in South Florida seven years ago. And, and how significant is that, 
that South Florida and South Africa, so many miles away, and you would think there's so many differences, but again, there's so many commonalities. Um, I learned that the, the compact had been established and it's, again, probably the most rewarding um, exchange and experience of my career. Um, the story doesn't quite end there, though. Uh, when we were in Bonn and we were talking ab about this in a, in a very similar uh, setup as, as I see uh, where you are today, we, we had the opportunity to have a, a, a longer session and a question and answer, and there were local um, appointed officials that were part of this kind of regional collaborative conversation. But the key question was, how do you actually go back to your own city and operationalize the compact? How do you decide that all this regional collaboration, how do you actually take the plan and the governance and the policy and put it to action? So I had the opportunity to go back to um, Durban in October, and I um, facilitated and, and, and kind of ran a, a one-day, six-hour workshop where I actually was able to share my experience in four years in Fort Lauderdale. And I talked about how I took that regional framework and brought it down and made it real inside a municipality. And so I talked about how I created the structure, how I found the right people, how I trained the right staff, and how I started integrating climate adaptation into the city's plans, into the vision plan, into this five-year strategic plan, and into our one-year budgets as well. So that story continues and our relationship continues, and we continue to plan. But again, like I said in the beginning, we're the front lines of action. And so with that, that is kind of the story of how South Africa and South Florida got together. And again, it's it's such a pleasure to, to be with, here, with you for just at least a few minutes. Um, to share that story. So with that, uh, Tony, I think uh, my portion is complete. And that's where I pick up uh, from you. Thanks, Susie. Uh, that was a fantastic summary of our relationship together as two cities. Uh, and not being satisfied with a tale of two cities, we thought we'd better make it a tale of three cities. Um, we've, we've really talked about what the compact is, so I won't stay on this slide. But in our March 2013 workshop that we had and in the subsequent uh, exchange with Fort Lauderdale and Susie and Jennifer Arado and the team in Southeast Florida, we developed this idea that around the world we have these cities where they are sharing common challenges around climate change. So for example, in Florida and Durban, we're both uh, coastal cities, so we have uh, sea level rise challenges. We like, in Durban, we focus on our strengths being our communities and our ecosystems. We have a fantastic network of ecosystems that provide us with ecosystem services and protection from climate change. So our adaptation approach relies on these two, our communities and our ecosystems. We call it SEBA, Community Ecosystem-Based Adaptation. And so the plan that you see in front of you, there's a number of cities or networks around the world getting together and agreeing to work together, doing these exchanges. We've heard about Durban and F Fort Lauderdale. And then we, our next exchange series were with uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And so we call these cities hubs. And then what Susie was explaining about these compacts, so these are these surrounding partnerships of subnational governments partnering together so that when you are implementing the outcomes from these hub exchange visits, the outcomes are actually spread to all the subnational partners around you. So for example, our own KwaZulu-Natal Climate Change Compact, many of our surrounding municipalities are very poorly resourced. I mean, Durban's not the, the best resourced city in the world by a long way, but it, compared to our surrounding municipalities, it's very well resourced. And we have a, a climate change team of four people, which is fantastic for South Africa, uh, for a municipality. But our surround the, the, the municipality officials and our surrounding municipalities, are, as Tony said, they're one person doing a huge range of jobs and they, they, they're they poorly resourced, they very little funds to do work. What do they do when, they, when they, they're faced with these challenges, something novel like climate change that they don't, haven't fully got a grasp of yet? Well, the compact provides a safety net for people and a network of people close to them that they know that they can pick up and call. One of the good outcomes we've had from our compact 
own compact met nine times now. We've had training events, a three-day training workshop, um, and I'll explain a little bit more later about a, a recent uh, LOX event that we had. Uh, a, a small municipality set up an air quality and climate change office as a result of engaging with our compact. So we, we know that people are getting confident to do work and they're starting to do stuff. Um, so that, there's a picture of our compact meeting. That was, the one on the right was during a three-day uh, workshop. You can, the little spider diagram is all our partners, our main partners. And down in the bottom left is the compact training workshop that Susie was mentioning, where we had a whole number of South African metropolitan municipalities officials attending, some Tanzanian officials, which I'll tell you about in a minute, our compact members, and even some Mozambican officials, all learning about how to operationalize a compact. And one of the things that we do th in these meetings is that we hold regional workshops. Our first regional workshop was in November in 2013 in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. And that was a really great workshop. Half of the workshop focuses on just training these city officials and uh, how to do climate change. Another part of it was uh, we worked with ICLE, local governments for sustainability, to develop an adaptation reporting page in their carbon climate registry. And these 49 city leaders were sitting in this little tiny room in sweltering hot Dar es Salaam weather in November, filling out the pilot reporting page of this carbon climate registry. That's the level of enthusiasm and the commitment that they, you see in trying to tackle climate change adaptation because it's such a big issue for us in Africa. You know that we're going to experience climate change roughly twice as much as the rest of the continent. We also faced with development challenges. Climate change threatens to undo those. And so people are taking it seriously. And that's why our signatories are, consist mostly of from uh, countries in the global south. So uh, that's another thing the regional climate uh, workshop in Tanzania did. The other thing was the mayors present, all of them passed a declaration that every single Tanzanian municipality will form a climate change committee and that these will organize into compacts. Hence, the, we had the Tanzanias come down for the compact training workshop. Um, the second workshop we had recently, that was in October, very similar event was the Southern African Regional Workshop held under the auspices of ICLE, the Local Climate Solutions for Africa Congress. And once again, capacity building, we had the Climate Reality Project provide the training to, for our officials there. And uh, we had a whole lot of great uh, outcomes coming from that. Um, I won't talk too much more about that because then I'll start uh, treading on Bali's toes here and he's a lot bigger than me. So let me just um, watch what I say here. <laughs> um, just to give you a, a pic picture, a schematic of what it looks like at the moment, we've also had exchange visits from Pemba and Kelimani in northern Mozambique and the, the same thing is emerging. They also attended our workshop and they've also committed to do compacts. So we've got this network of compacts happening uh, up the southern and east coast of Africa and we're planning to go into Ghana. Uh, two weeks ago we had a Ghanaian uh, de delegation arrive in Durban for an exchange visit as well and I presented this hub and compact approach and the deputy minister of local government, cooperative government, um, turned to his uh, liaison, he said, make sure that every single Ghanaian municipality reports on what they're doing for climate change and that the city of Tima, which is also a port authority, becomes the hub for the DAC and that they organize into compacts. The reason why this is happening is because there's a need for it, for the adaptation. And uh, for us as a DAC, we feel that we're making a lot of progress. What we still need is funds, obviously, all cities need funds to implement the work that happens, but at the compact level, at least you have city officials that are close to each other, they can plan easily together, they do plans that are at the level, at the scale of the compact, so it's a much bigger area than a, just a city level, and it works well, but there's more. Thank you, colleagues. Um, allow me to take over where Sean left. Um, as introduced by Tony, my name is Balina Wakabagali, working for the Department of Environmental Affairs. From that space, we are working with the policy, science, strategies, and also integration. However, finding ways to enhance the initiatives that have been taken by different uh, partners, particularly on climate change adaptation. 
our role as um, government, it's also to make sure that we unlock the different opportunities by working with other different government states, um, uh, different partners in terms of research, to assist in terms of providing that space for um, cities to um, address issues around climate change. We need to also understand or underscore the value of cities in terms of responding to climate change. We value their importance because of the initiatives that they've taken already. Some of the key elements that we need to remember is the role of cities in addressing climate change. Key functions are to sort of provide for service delivery and also make sure that they integrate the new technology and designs into their planning processes. However, at the same time, they're also taking into consideration the climate change impacts that therefore needs to be reduced by reducing vulnerability and also mitigate because of um, certain measures. The Department of Environmental Affairs um, initiated a process to develop the National Climate Change Response Policy that gives or lays the foundation on how government is going to respond to climate change, taking into consideration the different layers or spheres of governance that is national, that includes the different departments, provincial and also local government, whereby also the cities play such a very critical role. It is very clear that the impacts of climate change are not only going to be felt at national or provincial level, but also a significant input or um, um, impact at the local, at the city's level. That is where our people, societies, um, their access to needs, different services, it's based. And the, also, the response in terms of how these needs are going to be addressed. The, and then the department initiated a process, the long-term adaptation scenario project, which was looking at the holistic approach in terms of sectors, how is climate change impacting the different sectors, water, human settlement, ocean and coast, and also different vulnerabilities in terms of food and water security, which is a very key function in responding to climate change at a um, um, local government or the city's level. That process led to us establishing different um, um, forums. One, the Cities Resilient Forum, local government um, um, forum, and also the provincial government uh, forum to respond to climate change. Focusing on the Cities Resilient Forum, key elements are to look, make sure that there are response measures, there are vulnerabilities that we get to understand. So that means we initiate research, research processes, methodology, and also interact by building partnerships, as um, you have heard Tony speaking to, and also um, Shalin talking to that. We need partnerships to help in terms of unlocking and understanding and identifying the impacts of climate change and also the vulnerabilities. Then we also have to assist in terms of developing the so-called response measures or response strategies or plans that will be implemented at the local government or at the city's level. And obviously the Deben Adaptation Charter becomes one of the key tools. We use this as a, um, a tool to make sure that we can uh, translate or uh, enhance the process of responding to climate change through the cities program. South Africa has got key eight cities um, in the cities forum that we've established. And then within that forum, we share different elements, obviously issues around governance and coordination, um, establishment of different forums that leads to for an example, the complex, the hubs, because we are working with the different spheres of governance. We want to be able to share and learn. And obviously, the, vit the vertical integration from local government, cities, provincial, national, and also international influences, that, that plays a very big role in terms of responding to climate change. Moreover, is to share the experiences. What is that is replicable? Some of the projects that can be done, um, obviously, you've heard the story from um, Tony and uh, Tony, um, Sean and Susie, that something that happened in Durban can also be done in Miami, Florida. So if this is possible, there could be other projects that we can leverage, we can share experiences. And that is the reason why the Cities Resilient Forum, it's very important for us. Far beyond that, there are also initiatives like C40. There are gonna be programs that are gonna be initiated by different partners, which plays a very big role that can talk to climate change and energy, climate change adaptation, um, and planning, because obviously that becomes a key role. Um, there are also programs that are going to address issues around extreme events in cities. How are, we how are we improving our planning to address extreme events? We know the impacts of climate change to heat waves, to human health. These are some of the elements that obviously cities deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. During extreme events um, um, scenarios or situations, cities have got the responsibility to respond to those um, situations. And obviously, they actually invest a lot of money in that. The key message is, how do we then communicate? 
um, that message? How do we build early warning systems? How do we develop tools that will communicate to the communities with regard to that? So it's very important for us um, at the national government to make sure that we build relations with the local government, cities, and also the provincial government to see how do we synchronize our planning. Tools that can be used in Durban, they are now being used in Florida. That can be replicated in the city of Cape Town. That can be done in the city of Swan in, um, um, in South Africa. That is happening in, in Tanzania already. It's going to be happening in, um, in eastern parts of the, this world. So it's very important for us to learn from each other, yet at the same time addressing the key elements that is responding to climate change um, and, um, impacts. Obviously, we are going to build resilience. We are going to... Um, make sure that we reduce vulnerability and find ways and different approaches to address climate change um, impact. So the National Department of Environmental Affairs is fully behind the, uh, the Deben Adoption Charter, the initiation of the city citizen program. We endorse and work closely with the cities to make sure that this kind of a particular program um, be taken forward and funds or resources be allocated to make sure that that can be realized. Thank you so much. Um, so let me take one minute, maybe two, to try to um, compress all of that into a couple of uh, ideas. This idea of the compacts, these local compacts that bring together municipal governments, um, the idea that came from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, that Susie was talking about, that's now spreading throughout other parts of Africa. These compacts and the municipal governments that get together are starting to share capacity within those compacts and among those compacts. So there's capacity building from within these compacts and extended through the network of compacts that are being strung together. So this is south-south capacity building, if I can phrase it in a different way, and some north-south capacity building. And in addition, one last point. The vertical integration that Vali was talking about is basically the ideal of the NAP process, the National Adaptation Planning Process under the UNFCCC. The hope and dream of that process was that they would see national governments integrate the local with the national planning on adaptation. You're seeing it happen in South Africa. You're seeing it happen in Tanzania through these compacts that the national government takes part in as well. So here is the vertical integration, an example taking place, very effective so far, and we'll see where it goes from here. It's beginning to sort of catch on everywhere. But anyway, thank you for coming. And please, if you have any questions. Thank you for that. Very interesting talks. Do we have any questions? We have, all right, I'll take a couple. We have a lot of questions. That's great. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Stefano Mannasso from COBAS, uh, which is an independent scientific body. Uh, we have already had a side event about a project entitled uh, Electrical City and uh, Agroecological Parks. Just to mm, make a question about two key elements for us, uh, that introducing energy efficiency, that it seems very simple, but another part, especially for Durban and some cities from the area of the South, uh, like South America, Introducing also biodiversity in city uh, and agroecological parks. I would like to know if there are some uh, example or plan on biodiversity in city. I, I would like to express that biodiversity for us doesn't mean only the number of species inside, but relationship among them. I would like to formalize the, this point because uh, uh, South Africa and Durban, I know very well South Africa is plenty of traditional knowledge and uh, healthy of environment. Thank you. Thanks very much for the question. And <coughs> Durban, well, let me just start off saying that Durban is actually situated in one of the globe's 34 biodiversity hotspots. So we have 
very high levels of biodiversity and uh, indigenous and endemism, but also high threats to them. Um, Durban also has quite a long history of looking after its ecosystems. We have, I think, eight, nine biomes and uh, a connected system of open spaces, which we call the Durban Metropolitan Open Space System, DMOS, which is about 85,000 hectares. Uh, the total municipal area is about 270,000 hectares of open spaces, ecosystems that we use to help protect our residents from climate change impacts, but also to provide ecosystem services like flood attenuation or water quality improvement, you know, all the great things that ecosystems can do for humans as well as nature. So we have a proud history of looking after this, um, these, this connected system, and it's actually been uh, protected within our by municipal council who have approved our DMOS as a spatial planning layer, and any uh, applications uh, to build on this uh, uh, layer, on DMOS, have to go through an EIA process and all that kind of thing. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that there is a lot of development pressure in Durban. We, we need to be doing development. So any development that we do has to be sensitive to the, the needs of the ecosystem and the people as well. So we try and push through uh, methods of development that are actually appropriate for both climate change and uh, keeping our nature things like densification in, the, in certain parts of the city and um, public transport uh, systems that uh, are, are sensitive to it. We don't always get it right. I'm not saying that we're perfect, but we, we certainly do try. Thanks. Have a question over here. Please introduce yourself. Th th thank you. Um, my name is Xavier Shavana. Um, I come from Mozambique, from the Ministry of Economy and Finance. Um, well, I, I'd like to congratulate um, the, the, the panel for the discussion. Um, I, I, I don't have a question. I have a comment um, that I think that uh, probably will be valuable for, uh, for the initiative. Um, the, 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 my comment is that uh, for countries like Mozambique, uh, where municipalities rely on government transfers in terms of funding, um, it's really important to have the Ministry of Economy and Finance because it's the one who decides how much money is going. It's the ministry who can negotiate and discuss and probably influence the financing decision making to municipalities. So once uh, the development of municipalities is only special development and municipalities are not self-reliant, -reliant, so it's important to have a direct engagement. This initiative needs to engage the Ministry of Economy and Finance to make sure that the development planning that is envisaged and is done in the municipality that needs to be resilient uh, takes into account the contribution of the Ministry of Economy and Finance. So I come, I'm a deputy director of the, of the National Director of, uh, of uh, Monitoring and Evaluation, but we, I also work directly with the, the National Director of uh, Planning and Finance, or in budget. So the two are twin directorates, and are the one who make the decision, and are the one who, may, who should help the country to be accountable on what you're investing. In terms of, let us say, you talk, we talk about development, we talk about capacity building, we talk about special development in, in cities. So I think it's important to have that. And if you are working in similar situations in other countries, African countries, where the scheme is the same, government is transferring resources, any initiative that is taking place is based on, on central government allocations, so it's important to, to engage that. I have seen the images. I saw that the mayor of Kaliman, Ms. Araujo, and I, I, I saw um, my colleague from the National Disaster Management Institute. Um, so, okay, uh, Anna Kastina, this is a right person. Disaster management is one thing, but we're not talking talk about disaster, managing disaster like a rescuing people. We're talking about development planning that needs to be resilient. So you need to talk with someone else, or, or, or at least to include that one. So thank you. Thanks, Xavier. You're going to introduce us then. So as Sean said, is that an invitation to introduce the people from Durban? Uh, are you are you are you are you uh, are you volunteering? Okay, okay. 
I'm Joel Smith with, from Apt Associates in Boulder, Colorado. I actually had the pleasure to be in um, South Africa in August at the invitation of the State Department to meet with national government and municipal officials, talk about adaptation. Unfortunately, was not able to get down to Durban, which much to my regret, hearing uh, this. One of the issues that came up um, is this question of measuring effectiveness. And on mitigation, it's a lot clearer, you know, commit to 50 or 80 percent reductions. Adaptation, this can be a real challenge. I'm curious in the measures in the uh, uh, measures you're taking, do you have sort of metrics or ob clear objectives by which you can measure success? Because this is a challenge for the adaptation community. Not to hog the microphone, but <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll answer that as well. And yes, you're right. Adaptation is a messy business. Ad if you're doing adaptation, you must understand you're going to fail at least 30% of the time. And then you're being very suc uh, successful if you're failing just 30% of the time. And own those failures and learn from them. So, you know, we've published a fair few of our experiences in Durban now, and a lot of it's are about these learning experiences. How to develop a, a monitoring, reporting, and value, uh, verification system? I don't think it really works for adaptation. We kind of steered clear of that. So in working with ICLI, we've, um, <coughs> we work together to co-produce an adaptation reporting page. At this stage, it's more around cities reporting what they are doing. Um, so to build up a picture, to get an, a sense of what cities are doing, and then over time, when they're reporting every year onto the Carbon Climate Registry, we can get a sense of how much they're doing, how much they're increasing. I mean, you can look at this kind of um, anecdotal sort of evidence that we're seeing, or patterns that are emerging. Uh, for example, in our hosting of the LOX event, the, the Local Climate Solutions for Africa event uh, in October, uh, we are seeing more and more African officials attending these events and they are talking much better climate change sense. They are saying things so that we, under we know that the, the knowledge is improving in people. How do we measure that? Well, we, we do surveys at these events. So, for example, at our uh, compact training event, we did a, a survey then on, on how it went. Certainly in our uh, LOX event in November, we did a survey, and we're working on a paper to, to present that. Uh, I think you've, you've talked a little bit about the holy grail of reporting for adaptation. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult, and we, by no means are we are there there. But um, certainly for our own climate change strategy in Durban, we've recently approved an integrated mitigation and adaptation climate change strategy. And our mayor uh, chairs our, our new political climate change committee to oversee the implementation of the strategy. And one of the things that we want to do is monitor how effective we are at implementing the strategy. And we're going to work with the international uh, environment, uh, uh, RRED, uh, for around developing a monitoring framework of how we're doing for that. So perhaps if I can speak to you again in another year and a half's time, <laughs> we might have that grail uh, in our hands, that, that chalice, but as of this stage, not yet. So, so Joel, in answer to your question in part, in addition to what Sean just said, um, ICLE has uh, put together a, a draft, a new template, and we're experimenting, the DAC cities, the Durban Adaptation Charter cities, are experimenting with that template. It's a template for reporting on adaptation, measuring the progress. But it's largely qualitative, as you would imagine it would be at this stage of understanding of adaptation. It's not as easy as mitigation, where you can do it like a checkbook. It's much more difficult. And hello, you've been doing this a long time. So, um, but we are trying things. And there is a move to at least establish a baseline and for every city to measure its progress relative to that baseline. And ICLE, who's here today as well, has really done a great job in at least um, um, putting this first template out there to be used. I mean, we're all going to have to learn as we go along. And that's one of the nuts that are yet to be cracked. That's a tough one. I right, thank you. Any more questions? 
Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Marsha Kolanskaya from the Regional Environmental Center for Central and Eastern Europe. So, like, quite a different part of the world. Um, but, of course, uh, the cities in our region, they have uh, similar problems. Uh, probably, you know, different impacts, but uh, problems are similar. So, my question is, um, what was the major driver when you started this uh, process? Climate or other benefits which any municipality faces? So, and um, could you name, I mean, the whole panel, could you name, like, one, two co-benefits, which you consider the major ones to the climate adaptation process. Yeah, um, so Durban was a, a little bit unusual uh, in global cities in that we led with the issue of adaptation. And when I say we, it was really my boss, Dr. Deborah Roberts, who has been the champion of the climate change work in, in the city. And I think one of the, the reasons why we've done that is because climate change is so much more of a threat to us. And if you think of all African cities who have a low historical uh, emissions record and responsibility, but have a high vulnerability to climate change, it would be natural for them to uh, start with climate change adaptation. So our focus on it in getting into this work was completely climate change adaptation, but at the same time, there was a very strong link in our working documents between climate change adaptation and the value of biodiversity and what biodiversity and ecosystems can do to help protect us from climate change. Um, therefore, a lot of our work relies on restoring ecosystems, uh, managing them, and in doing that, it creates a lot of job benefits. So we have a, a really big uh, reforestation project, 700 hectares. It will, it will effectively be the largest indigenous forest in Durban once it's created. It's a bit like the Hubble Brook experiment in reverse. We didn't go and chop down a forest. We went and planted a forest to see, and now we've got a big research program around that. So. Um, it, it helps very much that uh, the type of work we do, our CBA approach creates jobs. It provides uh, funding, uh, money opportunities to where the most needed vulnerable communities are being able to build houses, buy food, get school fees, and that for their children through, this, uh, through these type of programs. At the same time, they also getting benefits, ecosystem benefits, from the, um, the restored ecosystems around them, so they're not getting hills washed away, soils being retained, so they retain their, their productivity status. And these projects are being replicated around the city. We have three re reforestation projects around the city now and, and outside of the city, and they're being scaled up. And you know, there's mitigation co-benefits, there's adaptation co-benefits. There's a whole bunch of really good things about them that make them a no-regret uh, approach to doing climate change. But the key focus was climate change. And in particular, the reforestation projects was offsetting carbon emissions associated with Durban's hosting of the FIFA Football World Cup in 2010. So the, even that in itself is a whole separate sub-story that uh, our mayor presented on on the first day here that we are at COP, and it, it's, it's, it contains all those good things. Thank, thanks, John. I think one, one of the key elements, I think, from the national government is to build a re resilient society. And obviously, we got to start somewhere. I think that is very important. And we started the, the research process to understand how vulnerable the cities are, how vulnerable the provinces are, and also the different sectors in government. Key sector which was very important is the human settlement, because obviously you're turning to your coastal cities, um, you're turning to um, urban cities, big um, cities in South Africa or other cities in the world. So it's very critical you start understanding their vulnerability and you start responding to that. And obviously the different cities have got key thematic areas where they excel and they do um, most of their work. Um, for an example, when you talk about resilience cities, it can be defined in many, um, um, in many ways. And I think that gives us an opportunity to understand what 
what, what is a resilient city? What are the elements of a resilient city? And that actually played a very big role. Moreover, um, it's, a, it's the issue around planning, because obviously your, your special planning, your spaces, your EBA projects, your biodiversity within your cities are very critical because they play a very big role for both adaptation and also for mitigation. Um, it, that, that in itself gives us an opportunity to say we can still explore more within these um, spaces because obviously you still need your, um, your eco parks. You need areas where people they can start be able to enjoy themselves um, and obviously ut utilizing the space within the city. Importantly, is the socioeconomic element of integrating climate change into your planning space. What are the benefits and what are the um, trade-offs? What is that people that can do better within cities that will help them in terms of saving their resources that are there, which obviously they are shrinking as a response to climate change or as an impact or as a result of climate change. Reducing vulnerability, enhancing resilience that helps in terms of responding, um, um, responding to climate change. Um. Yeah, and it's my understanding, and I could be speaking, and I'm sure I'll be reined in if I'm speaking off of the, uh, off of the map, so to speak. But um, I think there was a realization over time that adaptation by itself, planning could not, it couldn't happen independently of general municipal planning. It had to be integrated in that. And I think that's one of the lessons that we as a network learned over time as well. The hard way, perhaps. Um, um, but the other thing that I think everybody is deeply conscious of is that development, adaptation, building resilience, and jobs are all tied together. I mean, and so there's a you know, there's some really, you know, very, very basic elements to this as well. All right, thank you. We have time for one more quick question. Well, I guess I have one question. If someone's watching online from all across the globe and they say they like what they see and they want to get involved, who should they contact and how should they? The Durban Adaptation Charter website, www.durbanadaptationcharter.org. Sounds great. Can I uh, go ahead? In addition, Tom, we invite people to join us. I mean, really, we'd like to extend an invite to people to join this network and become one of our strategic partners and help facilitate the work plan. All righty, with that, I'd like to ask everyone to give a round of applause to our panelists here tonight.